Hi everyone, welcome to this session on community involvement in the IPDLN conference. Um, I hope you're all ready for three excellent talks. We're going to have three presentations of 10 minutes each, followed by 20 minutes of Q&A where you'll be able to um, have your questions answered. If you have any questions for the speakers, please use the uh, Q&A function uh, that, that is available to you there. Um, so you can enter them there and then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. So I'll begin by introducing our first speaker. So our first speaker is jo Dr. Jackie Street. She's a research fellow at the Australian Centre for Health Engagement, Evidence and Values. And she is going to uh, give us her presentation, first of all. And the title of her presentation is Community Attitudes Towards Sharing Government Health Data with Private Companies, A Scoping Within. So I'll pass over to you, Jackie. Thank you, Karina. I'm just going to share my screen, hopefully. Yep. So, um, sorry. Yeah, just had a glitch there where I couldn't seem to move the slides. Um, so this work was conducted at the Australian Centre for Health Engagement Evidence and Values, or ACHIEVE for short, at the University of Wollongong. And I'd just like to pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the university sits. So the background of this is that um, government data is collected and held in a range of jurisdictions uh, in the health system in health systems around the world and that linking data from those different um, systems sources can be enormously powerful particularly uh, for therapeutic development and for monitoring of new technologies new devices new pharmaceuticals and so it could be a potentially of large public benefit but despite this governments tend not to share uh, health data held in the public space with private industry. So the, as you heard in the previous session, if you were able to attend, uh, Felicity talked about the Australian Population Health Research Network, and they asked us at Achieve to look at this, to explore this context in which data sharing might, might occur with private industry. And the question that they gave us was, what is the public interest in? community attitudes towards and social license for the use of linked administrative data by private sector organizations for therapeutic development. So embedded within that, there were a lot of uh, smaller questions and I'm only gonna to talk to you today about the first one, what can the literature tell us about community views? And so we conducted a range of different studies and you've heard about a couple of those already, uh, but I'm gonna talk about the scoping review that we conducted. So in conducting this review, we developed uh, two logic grids, one using terms describing community views on the use of big data and one using terms describing social license and public interest. And interestingly, interestingly the second search found the majority of the papers. And we, from quite early on, we realized that um, we that a lot of this uh, material, the, the mo more useful material was in the gray literature. And so we also included Google Advanced and Google Scholar, as well as uh, several other usual, of the usual databases. And we screened nearly 7,000 articles, ended up with 35 included papers, and a third of those uh, included papers were from the gray literature. Most of the included papers were from the UK or the USA, uh, and there were smattering from other places. There were no um, studies from Australia, South America, Central America, Africa, Middle East, Russia, or much of Europe or Asia, although I'd, I'd have to say that it may have been that we failed to identify some articles due to the limitation that we imposed, which was English only. But because of that, we need to be aware that the set of publications may reflect a particular set of circumstances and may not be universally applicable. Although we um, identified papers published 2014 to 2019, the data collection uh, 
span was wider than that and uh, a range of qualitative, quantitative and mixed methods uh, uh, were used in the identified papers. So here I'm going to present the findings from six survey studies where members of the public were asked about their willingness to share uh, publicly held health data with a, a range of individuals or organisations. And um, willingness to share with their own health provider in this small number of studies was generally fairly high, whereas willingness to share with uh, for-profit research uh, companies or commercial companies, for example, companies that were involved in insurance or uh, marketing was much lower. Now, there were two more studies that included only patients and they were, patients were slightly more willing to share their data with um, private industry than non-patients, than the general public. And you can see that context matters because South Korea has lower uh, willingness to share data numbers across the board. So the I think we've already talked a bit about this. People have already talked, various talked about it. Other, um, Alison's talked about it, that the public generally really don't know very much about how all this works. Uh, they don't understand how the health sectors work. They don't understand the role of private industry within that, within the health sector and within health sector research. They don't understand how data can even be useful in, to a private company in conducting research. And they certainly don't understand that they're, what safeguards are in place um, and how data is owned and shared. And I think this um, quote from a participant uh, in a UK study sums up the confusion that some people have uh, about um, why this might be useful. People held a range of concerns about data security. They felt that um, electronic data was seen as vulnerable. Uh, and that was based on uh, knowledge of historical data leaks within health and uh, elsewhere. But also some participants in the UK thought that hospital record keeping was pretty disorganized and that that made it vulnerable to leakage, but also that it may be the quality of the data may not be very good and that sharing it might actually amplify that issue. Um, this quote uh, from a participant says that um, no amount of security could ever totally remove the risks involved in sharing data. And that relates not just to data security, but also concerns about misuse of data. And participants across the studies were worried that the data might be used for purposes of which they were unaware, or they might oppose, or that it might be sold on. And therefore that individuals, because their data has been leaked, might not be able to find employment, they might be discriminated against when they go for a loan or when they try to get a treatment or insurance, or they might be targeted by marketing company, companies. There was a, one study out of Switzerland where um, a, older participants had concerns about specific harms around eugenics. And across the studies, there was quite a lot of concern about surveillance. And people in particular were worried that an individual's, um, that everything would be known about individuals to the point where they would be, become transparent citizens within a dystopian society. Concerns were also expressed, and I, it's been a little bit talked about this already in the previous session, about using data to generate profit. And this related to that people felt it was their data and it had been uh, collected and held in a government and public space, and therefore it shouldn't be used for profit. That was just a general uh, thought. But also that um, they felt that private companies were much less likely to hold the public interest. They were less accountable to the public and they might be more driven by private profit to the point where some people were worried that private companies might um, uh, actually um, uh, suppress cures. They might actually suppress cures and um, if it wasn't in their interest. So willingness to share um, 
was conditional on a complex and interconnected network of factors. And these reflected those concerns pretty much. Uh, so people wanted that uh, to know that the research pur purpose was in the public benefit and that the sharing mechanisms uh, were robust, that the right people had access. They thought that some types of data were more vulnerable than others. They wanted good data security. Uh, they wanted good safeguards and they wanted that potential for individual and societal harm to be mitigated or um, you know, minimized if possible. So what does this whole, uh, this scoping study tell us about building trust? I think that the international studies suggest that um, sharing government health data with private companies will require careful, interactive public engagement, which, which has to address that um, public lack of trust with, not just with governments, but also with private industry, with both those entities, um, that the public benefit must be made explicit when data is shared. There needs to be effective interactive communication. It can't just be one way. It can't just be telling people. And it has to communicate how, with whom, and for what purpose data will be shared. Um, there need to be strict, well-publicised regula regulations on data sharing and use. And participants generally um, across these studies were more willing to share if there was some sort of consent mechanism uh, was included. But but uh, what that mechanism, what that consent mechanism is going to look like is, is up for debate. So thank you. This uh, study was funded by the PHRN. Thank you very much, Jackie. That was a, a great talk. And um, if anyone's got questions, please write them in the magic box and we'll have a question session uh, all together at the end. So thank you, Jackie. Um, our next speaker, is Carolyn Adams and Carolyn is a senior lecturer in, I'm going to say this wrong, Macari University where she teaches and researches the area of public law with a focus on human rights and open government. And Carolyn is going to talk to us about data custodians and social license for research. So over to you, Carolyn. Are you muted, Carolyn, perhaps? I don't know if it's just me or I can't hear you, Carolyn. Carolyn, um, this, sorry to interrupt you, I, we can't hear you and there seems to be a bit of a technical problem and so Karen in tech support has asked me if you don't mind if we could have uh, Faruka to speak next because you're, you're, you're completely no sound at all. I hope, that, hope that's okay. And then they know, no I can lip read you but I can't hear you. <laughs> Okay, so um, I think tech support will help you in the meantime, but if we can ask uh, Sarun, Sarun to speak next, that'd be, that'd be great. I probably pronounced your name wrong, sorry. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present uh, today at IPDLN conference. Um, my name is Darka Ripasinghe and I'm a PhD candidate at Monash University, a faculty of IT. And I co-authored this uh, research abstract with my supervisors, uh, Professor Prada Bilstein and Associate Professor Karsten Budol. And also my industry collaborator, Mr. Stephen Strange. Um, 
If you simply uh, look at my presentation title, you can probably guess what I'm going to talk to you today. Um, it's about the privacy consent. Um, so, so today uh, I'm going to share with you what we did and what we actually learned through uh, using blockchain technology to develop a dynamic privacy consent mechanism. The significance of uh, using dynamic consent in secondary use um, has been already identified in this Australian healthcare context. What you can see here is what I extracted from the proposed framework to guide the secondary use of my health records uh, data. So what is my health record? Um, that's the national digital health record system we have in Australia. As you can see, uh, a dynamic concept model to give people more control, keep them involved, empowered and informed is something that we might actually have in, uh, in the future. So uh, even though uh, our research is not directly related to my health records, it really motivated us to see this because compared to the other secondary use contexts such as data banks and clinical trials, I believe it's quite challenging to implement dynamic concept models for um, secondary use of electronic medical records. That's why we decided to explore further on the uh, same design challenge. Um, so in the current healthcare context, what we have is um, various static, um, broad and blanket consent management processes, which are separately managed by the different health data stewards. Therefore, in this research, we explored um, how to make the consent management process dynamic uh, while ensuring the collaboration uh, among all three key stakeholders uh, in a patient-centric manner. I want to elaborate further on what I meant by collaboration among uh, all key stakeholders. Um, what we believe is uh, it is not sufficient to only look at the data subject's point of view when developing these kind of uh, mechanisms. We also have to think about what data requesters and what data stewards also need. Um, in order to design the proposed solution, uh, we used a design science as the research paradigm and considered uh, eight design goals to guide our design process. Uh, so to come up with these design goals, we actually followed uh, several approaches. Uh, we conducted document analysis and literature analysis, and also we conducted discussions with um, several domain experts. Our aim was to investigate an evidence-based approach to get access to secondary use of data um, incorporated in patient consent. I also want to highlight here that the most of these design goals we identified are actually interrelated. Um, uh, so through the literature analysis, we also found that uh, one of the main challenges uh, in designing these dynamic consent mechanisms is designing the data infrastructure to support those uh, user interactions we need. Um, as we all know, the current healthcare context is highly distributed and decentralized. Therefore, without changing the way that is to develop the underlying data infrastructure, uh, we wanted to find a technology that supports uh, developing those secure interactions on distributed and decentralized environments. So that is why we choose blockchain, uh, because especially by leverage, leveraging the immutability that blockchain provides, we thought we can add the transparency and the accountability to this uh, process. Uh, we also use the business logics written on the blockchain um, known as smart contracts to handle the uh, workflows as well. Um, now I would like to take you through the high level design of this uh, proposed solution. Um, the process actually starts when the data requesters send out the data request uh, with the data profile that they need, the purpose of use for that and other related information with it. Ideally, in a dynamic consent um, process, what we expect is that the data subject would be um, um, 
going through uh, each and every data request and respond to them one by one. However, it can easily become an overwhelming task to the data subject. So in order to mitigate that, we introduced a mechanism to store the initial uh, consent preferences against uh, the different data profiles. Then when the data request arrives, smart contracts will check the data requests against initial consent preferences of each data subject and filter them based on those um, preferences. The data subjects can log into their accounts and see all the data requests divided into three different lists as consent granted data request, consent denied data request, or data requests that need handled uh, case by case basis. Until the data stewards um, start preparing the data set for the transfer, the data subject can keep, uh, are capable of changing the consent decisions uh, dynamically. Um, so we developed this solution on the Hyperledger Fabric blockchain platform, and we were able to demonstrate the technical feasibility of using blockchain to um, develop a dynamic consent mechanism. Um, however, what I developed is a social technical uh, artifact. Uh, so demonstrating the technical feasibility was not actually enough. So we conducted a semi-structured interviews with um, uh, 21 experts that we selected from health data and consent management domains. We gathered together feed these feedbacks, um, actually not only from the experts who represent the data subjects, but also the data requesters and the data stewards, because we wanted to conduct a more holistic evaluation. Expert evaluation process is currently ongoing, uh, but uh, I'm going to share with you uh, some of the findings that I've got, uh, more like the initial findings that I've uh, got, and also some learning, some lessons that I uh, learned throughout this process. Um, first, about the dynamicness that we introduced, um, the overall, uh, the most of the expert uh, participants actually found it um, useful. However, we found that it is really important to properly automate these tasks from the data stewards level to not to add extra workload to them. And especially regarding the specific granularity that we used, which is for requesting and managing consent preference in data profile level, um, from the perspective of data subjects, they actually really like it. They find it very useful. But from the data requester's point of view, in certain situations, they find it very challenging. But for a certain situation, it actually worked. So uh, when we look at the uh, blockchain and the smart contract aspect, uh, when using smart contracts to run these business logics from the data subjects perspective, um, they actually perceived it as an autonomous behavior even though it is not. So nobody wanted their consent decisions to be automated. Um, however, because of the traceability that blockchain provides, most of them actually found the consent process can actually become more transparent and uh, accountable. Uh, we also asked um, the experts, what are the legal and privacy challenges that we might encounter if we ever use solution like this in the real world? So one of the challenges that came up uh, is ensuring the privacy of the data requesters and the research they are doing uh, while ensuring the transparency that required uh, from the data, for the data subjects. Um, that's not something that I, I actually expected. Um, so another concern that uh, got raised from the legal perspective, as now data subject uh, is actively involved in, with this process, if something goes wrong, does that mean the data subjects are also irresponsible to this uh, to a certain uh, extent? Um, so those kind of questions actually make me rethink about and make me really needed to think about a new design cycle for my solution. And then about the data interpretability and the, and the interoperability, um, both were extremely tricky, even though we could demonstrate the technical feasibility and most of the experts also believe that the standards are needed. Uh, from the data stewards point of view, um, adhering to one specific standard is 
something they believed as not feasible thing to do. Um, so uh, before concluding my presentation, I want to thank uh, my supervisors and all the domain experts who supported uh, us throughout this research. And if you want to know more or if you have any questions, uh, please contact me via this email address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thruka. It's very, very interesting. Um, I'm just, I'm just checking with, um, with technical support to see if Carolyn is ready. Um, if, well, if not, if you can hear me, Karen. Ah, <laughs> yes, yes, I can hear you. That's Fabulous, wonderful. Thank you. Because uh, okay. I was going to have to improvise then, and people don't want to hear me <laughs> sing. <laughs> I'd hate you to have to start telling jokes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, me too. <laughs> Although you might be quite good at that, I'm not sure. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Karen's going to um, very kindly run my slideshow for me. Um, so if Karen, if you wouldn't mind just um, putting the first slide up, that would be great. Thank you. Um, terrific. All right. Well, thanks, Karen. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to contribute to the conference program for 2020. So I'd like to kick off uh, with a question for everybody. And it's whether you think that the work you do in relation to data linkage research is actively supported by your community. Um, how would you know? Next slide, thanks very much, Karen. So my presentation today touches on an aspect of a much broader project that I'm undertaking with my colleagues, Judy Allen and Dr. Felicity Flack. So we're exploring in a very broad way the processes and problems of gaining access to administrative data for research. Next slide, please, Karen. So if you're interested in these issues, including what data custodians had to say about the access and approval process, these articles may be of interest. In particular, the top article deals explicitly with our topic today, that is the role of data custodians in establishing and maintaining social license for research. Next slide, please, Karen. So data linkage research using personal information, often without consent, is generally supported by legal and ethical regulatory frameworks in Australia and other jurisdictions. Ethics committees are able and willing to approve a waiver of consent for research if the appropriate privacy and security protocols are in place. But does that mean that the research has the necessary support in the community that is, does it have the requisite social license? And do data custodians and the full range of other stakeholders need to care whether there's a social license for data linkage research? In our view, the answer to this question is yes, for ethical reasons uh, and also for instrumental reasons, which I'll touch on today. Our concern is that a lack of social license for data linkage research has the potential to undermine such research as it has undermined other health data initiatives such as care.data in the UK and my health record here in Australia. Uh, next slide, please, Karen. I'd like to approach this issue by thinking about these three questions. First, I'd like to briefly discuss our concept of social license. Second, I'll discuss the conditions required to support social license for data linkage research. And third, I'll touch on the role that data custodians and other stakeholders can, and in our view should, play in building and maintaining social license for research. Next slide, please, Karen. So as many of you know, the concept of social license to operate developed in the specific context of the resource extractive industries such as mining, oil and gas, and forestry, really taking off in the 1990s. Despite the fact that certain resource developments had all the relevant government approvals and were complying with regulatory requirements, they found themselves coming under fire from communities who were concerned with environmental and social impacts. Companies soon realized that formal approval and compliance might not be enough to ensure that projects got off the ground or continued to operate. They might also require the approval and acceptance of the community. That is, they needed a social license to operate. Next slide, please, Karen. 
There is now a relatively extensive literature discussing the nature of social licence. It's something that must be granted by the community and earned by the enterprise. It's an indicator that an enterprise is seen as legitimate and trustworthy, the two foundation stones of social licence. Social licence is based on beliefs, perceptions and opinions. And because of this, it's intangible, dynamic and non-permanent because beliefs, perceptions and opinions can change in response to information and circumstances. So although the concept was developed in the context of the extractive resources industries, it can also be applied in the era of data mining, the widespread collection and use of personal data by the public and private sectors, and the use of that data without consent in the data linkage research. Next slide, please, Karen. Our team, Judy, Felicity and I, has considered the question of social licence specifically in the context of data linkage research and even more specifically in relation to the decisions and decision makers who are involved in the collection, release and use of personal information for data linkage research. Because there's no direct relationship between the stakeholders in data linkage research and the community, it is difficult to ascertain whether a particular research enterprise has the support of that community. So the default assumption uh, is often that social license exists. And this assumption is to some extent reflected in the legal and ethical frameworks that regulate data linkage research. The volatility of social license only becomes apparent when there's a problem, for example, a major data breach. Next slide, please, Karen. We would like to see a much more robust approach to social license in the data linkage context. We are therefore in the process of developing a more detailed and explicit model for social license based on empirical research into the views of the public, our own empirical research with data custodians and theories of good governance and decision-making. As part of this work, the team, and in particular Judy Allen, considered 14 studies uh, from over the last 10 years that investigated public views in relation to research using either linked data or administra administrative data or both in Australia, Canada, New Zealand and the United Kingdom, as well as three broader systematic reviews. Our analysis identified a number of recurrent themes that pointed to the conditions that will support social license for research based on linked data. It became clear to us uh, in this analysis that there were two aspects of the research enterprise which require social license. First, the conduct and outcomes of the research itself. And second, the governance structures that support and allow the research to proceed. So in relation to research itself, support was confined to research that was seen to produce clear beneficial outcomes for the community. That did not result in discriminatory impacts on vulnerable groups, such as seniors and Indigenous people, that made appropriate use of data. There was concern about misuse of data, for example, for surveillance on selling to banks, insurers or employers. Uh, and we've heard that theme mentioned couple of times uh, this, this evening or this morning or the middle of the night, wherever you are. Um, and finally, that provided adequate privacy and security protection. So the degree of identifiability of the data was important. But in relation to research governance, the following conditions were identified. Demonstrated trustworthiness of decision makers and other parties involved in research. So the qualities of trustworthiness include competence, honesty, integrity, and benevolence. Those involved in the collection, linkage, and use of data, including decision makers like data custodians, need to consistently demonstrate these qualities in order to generate trust, which as we know, is one of the foundation stones of social license. Transparency of the decision-making process and the conduct of research was also important. Openness about the way the data is used and handled is essential to maintaining public trust in data linkage for research. 
Oversight and accountability were also seen as important. This included clarity about where responsibility lies, particularly when things go wrong, as well as decision-making processes and criteria that are clearly established and publicly available. Some level of independent oversight was also identified as important. And finally, consultation and collaboration with the community. So social license, as we know, is not simply a marketing exercise to sell the enterprise to the community. It requires meaningful consultation that leads to collaboration with the community to build projects based on shared values and objectives. So it needs to be a real two-way conversation intended to produce change. While ethics and some privacy committees already include community representation, this could also occur in the relation to the design of data infrastructure and policy, decisions about the linkage of new data collections, setting research agendas and advising on the design and conduct of particular research projects because social license is very context specific, the publication and implementation of research outcomes and so on. Clearly, these conditions relate to all the stakeholders in the data linkage enterprise. Data custodians are, however, a critical link in the decision-making chain that allows such research to occur. Data custodians therefore have a central role to play in developing and supporting social license by ensuring that their decisions and decision-making processes reflect the, the conditions discussed above. Having spoken to a range of data custodians in the course of our project, uh, it appears that good work's being done in some areas, but there is more work to be done in relation to some of these elements. Perhaps that could be said of all stakeholders in the data linkage research enterprise, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thank you very much, Carolyn. I think that was an excellent talk and it was well worth waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. We've had, we've had three really great talks. Thank you. Thank you all three very much. So what I'll do now is I'll have a look at the questions that have landed and then I'll, I'll start with those. And then we I think we can open it up for more people to write questions. I'm not sure if they can put hands up or if it's just in this magic box. But let's have a look. I think the first question. I've got to judge some of these by time, um, was for Jackie. Uh, and the question was, were all the studies in, in your project conducted face to face? Were there any online? And do you have any comments on the effectiveness of consumer engagement online versus face to face? Now that we're in the, the COVID era, really. So that one's for Jackie. OK, so. Um... I think, <laughs> I'm just looking at my data, I'm pretty sure that there were no online um, data, uh, you know, there were 35 and I face to face, so, oh, there was an online survey, one of them was an on, so there were online surveys, that's true, but there weren't any online um, uh, focus groups or anything like that, the focus groups were all, there were several online surveys. So, and our, our own survey was conducted online. So um, it depends what you mean by online because there was, um, I mean, I think surveys are fairly limited in what they tell us anyway, in that they can tell us what, you know, knee jerk re reaction is from a public that perhaps hasn't really had time to consider it very much um, and uh, doesn't have all the information that they need to make but not what some of them do, but um, perhaps some of them don't have all the information they need to make good um, responses or you know, what they might be considered responses if they had all the information. So um, I don't think, uh, I think that one of the things COVID might do is actually open up some of these opportunities for doing online focus groups online, whether that'll happen though, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, th thanks Jackie. I mean, I think, there are some going on. I don't know <clears throat> if you were in the uh, symposium that preceded this session. I know that Kim and her group and some others as well and myself, we've run some uh, online focus groups and deliberation. And I think, you know, perhaps 
it's something that we may end up in the future with some sort of nice hybrid where sometimes we go face to face and sometimes we take advantage of the technology. I don't know, I suppose. It, it, it seems to be a, a developing area, though, where people are trying to do more of that. So perhaps if you if you if you look in the future, when you look at the literature, you may find some published studies that have done that. But of course, your literature re review is up to 2019 when the word COVID had not been heard, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was one little point someone mentioned, you know, when you said that there were no Australian studies. So someone called someone um, popped a little comment in to say it might have been something you, you found but didn't include. It was public attitudes towards data governance in Australia. And he sent a link to it, which I think I can probably share with you if I can pick it up and drop it in the chat or something like that. So that might be a, a useful point. Uh, just as a, a maybe one extra one. Was it before 2014 though? Ooh, could be. I, I can't tell from the link. No, I'd have to. I, I won't go in now, but I, I can check. It may well have been because you had a five-year window, didn't you? A five or six-year window. Oh, but yes, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, then there was a question. I must. I must get this. Thruka. I hope that's correct. What I've got is I've got. Thruka's name spelt three ways in different places on things I've been given. <laughs> so I really don't want to offend anyone. It's Thruka, okay. I think, is correct. Um, so what I've got, let me see. Um, there was a question. Have you compared output of online dynamic consent with a routine consent process? I imagine with dynamic consenting comes the challenge of keeping up with public engagement at all stages. I don't know whether have you, have you been able to compare. Um, I'm, I'm assuming by the output they might mean the consent rate. I'm not sure. It's a it's an anonymous post, so if the person can hear me, they may want to write in a little extra. But what, <laughs> are you able to answer that question? Yeah, um, I think I can. Um, uh, Probably, yeah. Um, so that's actually a great question. If we compare what we are currently doing with, um, uh, you know, uh, managing consent and what I am proposing here with Danny consent. So actually in my research, I've started uh, by talking to people about the uh, experts uh, and especially the privacy advocates around. Um, what can we improve uh, with the existing consent process that we currently have, especially in the secondary use context? I had to highlight it. This is not about the primary use, it's about the secondary use of data. Um, and then I actually found a few issues around the collaboration and transparency and um, not being able not being able to dynamically change their uh, decisions and so on. Um, actually, that's where I started looking into this process. And I want to thank that person for asking that question because uh, this is very important to know, uh, especially when it comes to public engagement um, uh, to a certain level with certain community, it's going to be challenging. I had to agree with uh, them because it, when I look at my work, uh, there are two main limitations that I have to highlight. One is the, the level of e-health literacy that required. So it's not the IT literacy, it's the e-health literacy that we require. And when I talked to my experts and they also told me that um, this is going to be really challenging and I want to uh, uh, mention that but just Carolyn uh, talked about related to social licensing and uh, that is a huge, huge part in here as well. So this comes with a lot of challenges and um, we had to be cut out of effort to make these things better. Um, this actually related to the Jesse's, uh, Jesse asked question as well. Is that okay if I answer that? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, I didn't realize you yeah. could see the question, Cindy. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, so Jesse has asked a really great question and it's also um, actually related to one of my limitations with uh, uh, that's related to my current design scope uh, because in current design scope, the other limitation that I got is um, 
only and I have only the cadre data subjects who are capable of making the consent decisions by themselves. But we know that uh, consent is more complex than that, you know. So it's 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 kind of not designed to uh, address all these requirements, especially um Jesse actually she's talking about the need of um, representing these authorized uh, representatives uh, in managing consent. Great question. Um, because what I believe is even though in my current design scope, uh, even though I'm not answering that question, the blockchain is going to be an amazing uh, way to handle that. Because if you want to, uh, if that child want to, you know, want to uh, one day to see uh, all what really happened with, uh, you know, with uh, when he was a child, or she was a child, then uh, they can uh, use this transparency that blockchain provides, the traceability of uh, everything, and that person can really trust that. Um, so, uh, so using blockchain for um, addressing this issue, uh, this uh, specific requirement, I think it's going to be perfect. Um, and there's another uh, question that uh, he has traced around uh, handling uh, missing information using blockchain. I think I actually talked about uh, the smart contracts. That's business logic that we can actually written on a blockchain and uh, the same thing that actually people perceive as making things more automated and more autonomous. And we can actually make these for the for this for this purpose and it's actually not making anything automated or like anything like it's making things automated but not not autonomous so um so to address these kind of scenarios i think we can develop smart contracts to manage that and also uh, i have to mention that uh, actually the legal compliance is one of my uh, design goals um, because of that I have selected GDPR for that. I know it's not going to work for all the regions out there, but uh, the GDPR, the opt-in consent is uh, what we need. So what we, what I have uh, added in my solution is uh, that and then public uh, decided not to involve, the person decided not to involve in this process then we will consider it as a, 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 you know, as a negative, like it's a denied consent. That's what we actually uh, consider it. But I know, uh, I'm referring back to the previous question I had on the consumer engagement. Um, uh, then uh, I know this considering opting consent and uh, um, people might not, um, the re data requesters uh, might not be okay with it because people, we can't make people uh, engaged by force and it's just something they have to do it by themselves and then mm -hmm. I know there are going to be some impact. Thank you very much yeah. for those questions. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, actually, I just want to make a little comment on, on what you mentioned there, um, just something, uh, Saruka, around the GDPR consent and thinking about your model for consent for the use of um, uh, of data for research. Um, consent under the GDPR is not the same as the consent that you might want for the use of data for research. And you might just want to check because generally for research, people don't rely on the consent aspect of the GDPR. They generally rely on, if it's non-commercial research, a task carried out in the public interest because the consent bar in the GDPR is extremely high. And so the consent you're talking about is more of a research ethics consent, which is a slightly different thing in the, those jurisdictions than uh, the consent under the GDPR. So just want to check that. Consent in the GDPR is for data processing, whereas the consent for, uh, for research is it's overseen by ethics committees. So just check it before you build it in, <laughs> check it. Thank you very much, Karen. That's that's a really good uh, insight. Yeah, it, it, Thank it, you is very a, much. it is a thing that comes up. <laughs> check it, it out. is a thing yeah. that comes up. Yeah. Thank you okay. very much. We, all right. We, we, these have been really great talks and I can see there are not that many more questions now. So I'm going to ask my question. Um, and it's a general question, but I might throw it over to Carolyn first. Um, my kind of area, area I've, I've focused on is an unusual area, which is what happens when data are not used as being far more than losing the benefits of data use. And 
I have used it a bit in terms of public engagement as well, not in any way to spread doom and gloom and death and massacres and such like, but actually a few points have come up partly in the symposium and partly in this um, about willful with withholding of data that does sometimes happen, where there have been drug trials, where companies have held the data back knowing more than they than they release, or there are all sorts of reasons why data might not get used, with the result being massive harm and, and such like, and not just the loss of those benefits. Because sometimes you can say, oh, we're aiming that this research will have a public benefit, but you can't necessarily promise that it will, because until the outcomes come, we don't really know. But what we can know is that if data are not used effectively, awful problems happen, extra tests have to take place, um, treatments are missed, um, Break data's not joined up. People come to harm. There've been there's some examples I can I can give you. You know where, for example, uh, there was an unpublished study on one heart drug, and it was a small study that didn't get published, and a hundred thousand people died because it was wrongly administered. Then when the inquiry happened, this study came forward and said, ah, we found something similar, but the study was small. And there are examples like that. So I just want to throw it to the panelists, really, in, I'm told we've got three minutes. Does anybody, when they talk to the public, ever mention that, not as I say, not in a coercive way, but just that actually benefits are great, but without the use of data, there can be big problems. Um, that it, it can help with getting a kind of more holistic picture, really, of the use of data. And sometimes you get the feedback from, you know, deliberative processes that people just assume that you're using the data and that they're quite supportive of that and that they understand that um, the use is, um, you know, in, in the public interest. Um, th there's all this um, uh, hesitancy, though, about sharing with the private sector. So I guess mm. there's that. Um, but so long as you were talking about sharing within the public sector, including public universities, I think there's quite established, I mean, there's well established support for that um, yeah. in sort of the uh, research. So, you know, the, that nuance that you need to get the, the good and the bad results out there, uh, I think is part of um, a lot of the elements that all that go to social license, like trustworthiness, transparency, mm, yeah. um, mm. you know, it links into a lot of the themes we've been talking about. And I don't mm. think you get any pushback from the community on the idea that good and bad mm. results need to be put into the public domain and that, in fact, they should be required to be put into the public domain. And that was one of the issues that came up with the private sector because it's not in the interest of a, a pharmaceutical company to put the poor results out there. It might impact on the bottom line. So that mm. is really a conundrum for sharing information with the private sector. Not, not so much for the public sector, although, you know, they still there still might be some hesitation, but certainly the ethical requirement should be to put all of the results into the public domain. Indeed, yes. Um, I have actually got a question that's landed for you now, Carolyn. Um, have you thought about approaches to rebuilding social license after an event such as a data breach that has reduced public confidence? Um, I'm told we've got a couple of minutes. If you've got any thoughts about after a data breach, you know, what can happen there really? Yep, so this is the big, um, this is the thing that everyone worries about is um, a breach, uh, a data breach. So the upside of social license is that it's based on beliefs, perceptions, and opinions. And because of that, it's dynamic. So you can lose it, but you can regain it. And the way to do that is to demonstrate the elements of trustworthiness. So honesty, for example, um, when the Australian government census data or census um, process went skew if uh, recently, a couple of years ago, um, they needed to fess up and, and, and sheet home responsibility, cl like claim responsibility. Um, so be honest, uh, be responsive. What are we going to do about it? Um, appear, you know, you need to promote yourself as a responsible, legitimate, trustworthy 
data custodian. And um, because social license is dynamic and non-permanent, you can build it up again. So it's not gone forever. Mm. Um, so there, there is this upside and a downside to the sort of volatility and fluidity of social license. Um, and so long as you demonstrate those elements of trustworthiness, um, you will be able to rebuild. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much to all speakers. And thank you for managing the tech, Karen, and for coping with the tech, Carolyn. Um, that's been a really, really good session. Um, I think the only thing I need to say is that I think this session will be available. I think it's in 48 hours. So if anyone else wants, you know, if your colleagues want to listen to it, it'll be available. And if you enjoyed this one, there are other ones that are on the on demand um, as well and posters to look at. But thank you all very much. It's been lovely meeting you. We can't do a round of applause for the panelists because all the participants are on mute. So I'll just have to do it myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.